Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk sponsored by the Friends of the Bodleian. Uh, we're not expecting any emergency, but if a fire alarm does happen to sound, please exit the way you came in or the door at the back of the hall and gather outside the Western and Broad Street. Claire has put out some feedback forms, and we'd be grateful if you would fill these in. If anyone hasn't got a pen, we have some pens down here. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I also want to welcome the many friends who are joining us online today, and I have a couple of housekeeping announcements which I hope will be of use to them. Those joining online will notice that automatic closed captioning is uh, in operation, but that can be discontinued uh, by simply clicking the CC live transcript at the bottom of your screen. We will have time, as usual, for questions at the end. If you are joining us online and you want to ask a question, please type them into the Q&A, which opens up at a bottom, uh, click on the bottom uh, window of your screen. Please don't put the questions into chat because we won't be monitoring that. Having said all that, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Chris Butler, who is a lawyer and past president of the Boston Map Society. She currently serves on the board of the Washington Map Society and is a contributor to Map Exploring the World in association with Faden Publishing. She's an award-winning home brewer uh, and has combined her interests uh, in uh, <laughs> interest in beer and maps to give numerous talks uh, around drink maps, including at the International Conference of the History of uh, Cartography in Amsterdam and at Harvard University. And today she's going to talk to us about Victorian drink maps. So please give her uh, a warm and I hope jovial uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor McCabe, uh, for giving me and the Friends of the Bodleian for giving me the opportunity to share this mappy bit of history today, and especially to the Bodleian publishing team, um, who, but for them, there would be no book, and Stuart Ackland and Nick Willie, uh, who were sort of the spark of this whole adventure. So today, I'm going to provide some background and then explain how and why drink maps came to be why production of them surged for several years, and then conclude with how and why their publication came to a trickle over the span of just 25 years. So please allow me to set the stage. There was a drink problem in much of the Western world. So we're really talking between 1830 and 1900 is the, the time span I'm gonna discuss. Neither any woman and most men could vote at this time, and I'm gonna explain why that's important to drink maps a little bit later. But since the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, work had moved from farm and field to factory and dock. And over the century, trains replaced horses, water closets replaced outhouses, electric lights replaced candles, newspapers were the Instagram of the time, and thanks to technology that made paper and printing cheaper, trains carried the word around a little bit faster. Cities built up so fast that there wasn't really much time for planning. So cities had churches and pubs, and pubs were the other center of life. So they were places where people met, everything was done in the pub to lo from local meetings, even voting, and people were paid there in public houses often owned by their employers. So what was the first thing they did with their new wages? Apparently, a lot of people had the same thought, I'll drink them. And the employers would say, you can just put that on your tab. And then the following time that they would be paid, it would have been deducted. And they would see, and then they would maybe drown their sorrows in another drink. Um, this was not just a UK phenomenon. There was a drink problem around the world um, in, in Germany, Sweden, Australia, Canada, um, truly something that kind of morphed, uh, historians suggest, from the Industrial Revolution and the new living conditions that created. So the other thing that happened at this in response to that were anti-drinking organizations known as temperance groups. 
They also formed all over the world. Um, Italy even had one in, in um, 1830. In the UK, it was believed that gin and other high alcohol spirits were actually the problem, not so much all alcohol. And if they could just make beer a little more easy to access and lower the tax a little bit um, and made it more available, they really believed that people would drink less gin. And this was the impetus for the 1832 new law called the Beer House Act. Pretty much anyone could pay a fee and sell beer from their house. People were already home brewing anyway. Most families had beer. Beer was uh, consumed on the job. Children drank beer, and it was a very normal thing to do. And drink houses exploded. So at first, alcohol was blamed for increased crime, poverty, general poor living conditions, instead of it being thought of a result of other circumstances like overcrowding and poor health or lack of education. And so at the same time that drinks were, uh, that drunkenness was escalating, so was social reform and ideas that were coming out about how we can handle this, not just temperance, but other things about how to make people's lives a little bit better. In 1850, the population moved from mostly rural to mostly urban in the UK, and it has never gone back. So how do we how do they solve this drink problem? Well, at first, they decided moral pressure. We're going to, for example, have you sign a pledge in front of all your friends and family promising not to drink anymore. And just in case that didn't stick, some of the pledges were in short time increments. So if you lapsed six months later, you could do it again and you always always forgiven. So uh, so this is our backdrop. And now I'm going to tell you some stories, show you some maps, and some of the stories are in the book, uh, some are not. I've tried to make sure the images you're going to see are either super detailed close-ups from the book or not in, in the book at all. And as an American who wrote about, about British beer, British maps, I'm also going to try to weave some cross pond boozy history into this. So the story begins with the buzzkill of a man. He was an American. <clears throat> this is Neil Dow. He is given credit, if that's the word, for igniting prohibition in the United States by making Maine the first state in the US to pass laws to restrict alcohol. And he kept on pushing until Maine was the first state to enact full prohibition. Now, I'm showing you his study because I want you to notice the spelling of Maine. Um, what does Neil Dow have to do with the UK? Well, this is Sir Wilfred Walt Lawson of Manchester, the UK's buzzkill version of Dow. He admired Dow's approach to the drink problem, meaning through legislative changes and regulations instead of just moral pressure. He led one of the earliest and most influential temperance groups, the United Kingdom Alliance. Based in Manchester, which is how Main Road got its name. I didn't realize the football significance of this road until I sent the first chapter into the Bodleian and, and um, it was pointed out that this is actually named after um, Neil Dow's, the, the, the admiration for Dow's state <laughs> and his approach to temperance. So I just wanted to show the slide about this is where, <laughs> this is where it is. Uh, and some geography, just so you can see where Maine is. So Maine is in the upper, very far northeast corner of the U.S. And for some context, I live in Boston. That's where the heart is in Massachusetts. And then New York City is where the arrow is. So Boston to New York is about a four-hour drive, just to give you some idea of the proximity of, of how these things are. Now, let's look at some gorgeous maps. What is a drink map? First, it's a single town or city marked to show places that sell alcohol, published by anti-drinking organizations, to shock people in a glance how many are clumped together. The visual is often accompanied by language on the map itself, primarily in the UK from 1875 to 1900, with examples at either end as well. Early on, the words drink map did not appear in the titles or on the surface of the maps, yet they supported attached text. 
like this one we're looking at now. This is 1860, uh, and it, the map is attached, folded out. You can kind of tell on the left side it is actually attached to a four-page pamphlet about the connection of drink and crime. The image was meant to support the argument outlined in the accompanying text. So there's no geographical details other than the Thames River, but look closely. It, it is, it's supposed to look like a rash, which was not an accident. Red was used to suggest sickness. So look at the detail. I mean, it's beautiful, right? You can see why I got hooked on these things. They're just, they're just gorgeous. Okay, so in 1878, the words drink map first appeared on two maps. Norwich, here. Notice the fancy cartouche, meaning the scribble around the title. Uh, and the compass rose. Not all drink maps have a compass rose. It's unusual. That same year, the drink map of Southampton, 1878, uh, and on the right, I just wanted you to see the um, yellow triangle is the blow up of what's on the right. Just, I mean, you can imagine walking down that street, how many places there were. You can you just go from one after another. So both of these maps had brief text on the back, appealing to magistrates, explaining how the public could pressure magistrates to stop granting licenses. Magistrates were the ones granting liquor licenses. I haven't found anything to indicate the, the makers of these maps knew about each other, but it's clear that the image is now the primary focus. First, you saw the map attached to text. Now the text is on the back, the image is primary. So there were two quickly successive events that really escalated the growth of drink map production. The first were instructions about how to make one. So in this newspaper article, this is, I want to show you the newspaper article because um, the British News Archive, it's, while it's a little pricey, it's my very favorite way to spend, for example, an evening when you don't want to do anything else. You can take a dive into history of, um, it's sort of like going into a library and looking for the book you want and your eye gets distracted by, oh, I didn't even know that existed. There are fascinating stories about um, stolen horses and all kinds of other things. So uh, I, I use this a lot and then the, the archive does have the Alliance News. The Alliance News was mouthpiece of the United Kingdom Alliance, Wilfred Lawson's uh, organization. And they were very smart about how they reached people because they had their own temperance news and they allowed other temperance organizations all around the country and, and in Scotland and in Wales to pay a subscription and put their own news in it. They could submit their temperance calendars. They could show their leadership and their, their major events and things they wanted to talk about. Also, the Alliance News would share template in template letters to magistrates, um, all kind, even sermons. I mean, they they would try to share information. And they were there were branches all over the place. So they really were a grassroots organization in a very fundamental way. So I'm gonna read the instructions. Well, first I'm gonna explain something. Close up of this article by Solicitor Hayward, Hayward with the instructions in August, 1882. Now you'll see it's called Anti-Licensing Memorial. And I mentioned that most people couldn't vote, but what they could do is go to a meeting and at the meeting they would say, here's our position on something. Let's say it was a temperance meeting and we're gonna submit our position to our local magistrates. And then people could sign it people who couldn't vote, women could sign these memorials and be noticed. They would get, they would feel like they had a say. Now there's no guarantee that the magistrates actually read these, but when you couldn't vote, it was a very powerful thing to have a memorial. So Solicitor Hayward suggests, and I'm just gonna quote the middle part. First, get a large scale ordinance map of the district. Mark on it the site of the house for which a license is sought and stick a small black or wet red wafer or a piece of paper on the site of the house already licensed, distinguishing the beer houses and off license houses by tickets of different shape. I have often seen magistrates astonished by a map so decorated. In some districts, it will appear literally pitted with public houses. So instructions are out there. Second reason drink map production took off was a licensing case from a town called Overdarwin that gave magistrates the power to deny licenses 
where previously there had to be proof of negative conduct, such as drunk and disorderly behavior, connected to the license. The story of the case is this. To be a business allowed to sell beer to take home, meaning an off license, you had to apply for an annual license on the same day each year set by statute. The day was called a Brewster session. So imagine it's 1882 and a group of magistrates have assembled to decide on the applications. So what, what, is, what do you have to do to be a magistrate? Well, you have to be property owning white man without, uh, without legal training. You could have legal training, but most of the magistrates did not. And you, your property had to produce income. This cut out the recently rich of the industrial revolution. So fortunately they were led by someone with legal training who was in, incongruously called a clerk. I don't know about in the UK, but that's a sort of low level term in, in the US. And in 1882, all of the grocers in the market town of Over Darwin applied for the licenses to be renewed. But this year, the magistrates objected to all of them, meaning unless the applicants could show that the neighborhood needed it, the license would be denied. This is new. Just two weeks earlier, a new, mac a new act had passed loosening the standards for magistrates to deny a license from requiring proof of drunk and disorderly conduct or other transgression to simply whether the neighborhood needed it without defining need. This gave applicants here 74 grocers, including Mr. Alexander Kay, two weeks to prepare their arguments for why they should be able to continue to sell alcohol. Two weeks later, at what was called an adjourned rooster session, meaning one of challenged licenses, when people saw this in the paper, they would know that this was gonna be exciting because there was you know, a, a disagreement. So these magistrates heard testimony of police, applicants, and so on. They deliberated for eight hours and they consulted a map. I had read about this map. I knew they had consulted a map based on some legislative history at the time. And I had contacted the local archives of Darwin and Lancashire surrounding ones as well. And they had reached out to their colleagues and assured me no one had heard of this map, so I couldn't find it. Anyway, the magistrates looked at a map, considered how close the places to secure alcohol were, and decided not to grant 34 of the 72 objected to licenses, nearly half. And in their decision, they said, even with half of the licenses denied, still no one had to walk more than two minutes to buy a beer. So you can imagine, if you still don't, you, you could still get a beer every two minutes, they must have been incredibly, um, concentrated. So I'm going to show you this. Here, I believe, is the map. Notice North is not at the top. It's not an ordinance survey. There is no title. So let's look more closely. So even though it's not part of this case, there are, I, don't, I want to explain the circle. These are called yardage circles, and a lot of drink maps have these on them so that um, you can easily count within the circle how many places there were to buy alcohol within a certain number of yards of whatever the, they decided the center would be. Let's look even closer still. I'd like to point out the three lists on this map showing the three types of licenses, public houses in red, beer houses in blue, and off licenses. The first two columns are complete. This last one, the one about the disputed licenses in this Brewster session, is unfinished. However, there are green marks on the map that correspond to the addresses in this list. Meanwhile, I'd been researching the contemporaneous newspaper accounts, and the day before the Over Darwin adjourned Brewster session, these appeared. So the addresses of all the challenge licenses had been published in the newspaper. It was unusual at the time to list yards to another public house, but as you can, as you can see, it has who owns the license, the location of the place, the, the off license, and the number of yards to the next closest place. Uh, so we could see what the magistrates were um, focusing on, proximity. And now a story within a story. Um, as I said, I couldn't find the map. I decided to at least drive to Darwin. I moved over here for the last two months of researching the book and I was I really wanted to look get to know Alexander Kay and find out what, what was his story. 
So I drove there and I, I knew the address of his grocery store. And it turns out the address scheme has changed to the point that it was literally impossible to figure out where his grocery store was. I mean, I could kind of figure it out, but I thought I'm not going to leave um, this place without, you know, at least having a beer. So, um, <laughs> so I went to a local pub, which is this place, bird in the hand. And I met a local, Ray Taylor. I explained why I was there. There's only one other person in the pub at the time. Turns out Ray was born and raised in Darwin. He's a um, computer scientist by day, but he likes his beer and he likes his maps. And he said he thought he knew of such a map. And the next day he sent me by email the map I've been showing you, um, which is published in the book for the first time. I still have never touched a copy of this map, but here is why I believe the map it is the map consulted by the magistrates. So it's hard to see, but this matches up the map with the map exactly. On the left is the unfinished column of off licenses shown in green on the map and starts with Moss Bridge Terrace, Blackburn Road. The second Duckworth address street that's in the newspaper is not on the map and their license was denied. Only the licenses granted that day are on this map. So. I tell this story, which is very exciting to me. It was a very exciting moment when I realized this was going on. So uh, I tell this story, though, because um, once the decision was out that magistrates had successfully struck down licenses, um, the and it was it, it succeeded on appeal all the way to the Queen's bench, and the temperance folks jumped on it. This is a long way of saying. The second and more dramatic escalation of drink map activity was the result of this case, which seemed to give magistrates way more power than they had before to slow and even reverse the number of boozers. And temperance groups leveraged this decision by publishing maps in an organized strategic way with the holding of the case printed on the back of the maps with detailed instructions about how to use the map to persuade magistrates across the UK, starting with the drink map of Oxford. So if you haven't seen it before, this map doesn't even show the university itself. Uh, and I would not know about any of these maps if it weren't for Nick Malie, who's in the room, map curator here, who showed me this map in, I think, 2005. This is Nick holding the map. <laughs> Sorry, Nick, I didn't tell you I was doing that. Uh, and on the back of the map is a long plea to both the public and to magistrates about too many drink dens and, and a, a begging to stop allowing more. The case is woven into the text by name. Here's an altern, alternate title, by the way, to the drink map of Oxford, uh, just a little different. This, so they actually have two copies. And here is the back. So I'm gonna give you a quick story. Um, <clears throat> One thing I found a little fascinating and a very good way to research things when I was working on the book is looking at death notices. So they weren't called obituaries yet, but death notices of some of the high profile temperance people. And one I came across was this man, um, Skinner, and it said he died presumed drowned, body not found. And I thought, oh, okay. So I dug in a little bit and all the people he left behind, he was actually involved in a lot of temperance organizations. It turned out, he was um, a railway engineer and he had been caught on the train with the same exact ticket, the same ticket for the date the prior year. In other words, he'd used, he'd saved and used the ticket from the year before to save paying the fare. And he was charged for this. And so while that court case was, was pending, gone out one night, by this point, he'd moved from Oxford to Deal as he moved up the UKA um, structure. And he collected all of the subscriptions that night, all these temperance groups paid for the to be in the UKA. And then his clothes were found on the beach. And the obituary said, it was such a nice evening, surely he could not resist bathing. And there was a funeral, uh, several memorials printed, and then, and he had a wife and three children. And three months later, his name was mentioned as the family let someone know that they knew he was alive in the United States. So I guess he took all the money and hijacked himself to the US to avoid paying or having being charged with that. So, so much for all the temperance 
uh, folks being, you know, very fine mighty. So uh, that, oh, I should show you this. Okay, this is this is Skinner, whose name is on this drink map of Oxford. All right, the other map that came out the same time that the drink map of Oxford did is very different. This is the drink map. Well, it's not called the drink map of Liverpool, but this is Liverpool, 1883. Uh, the, the, there's nothing on the front. So this is a base map. A base map means a map produced for a sort of general purpose that other people could then use to put their own information on. So the front of the map has absolutely no text about why those dots are there. And I'll show you a close up in a minute so you can see that well, I'll show you now. They really pop and uh, those red marks, but there's not, you can't look at the face of the map and have any idea why there are red marks there, which I think is kind of funny. Um, and it's all on the back. So here's, this is only half of it. There are another four panels of single space explanation of how to use the over Darwin case excuse me, and all kinds of nuanced legal arguments. And it, it's it's actually quite confusing. I think they're trying to clarify things, but it's about license transfers and all the possible situations. So, but it did have the over Darwin case. And I and the, the reason especially why this is important is it, I have been able to kind of connect this as a strategy um, by connecting it to the drink map of Sheffield. It's hard to see here, but I will show you the title. And you can see the title is also the legend. It is called the drink map of Sheffield. And the legend just says um, on and off licenses. Very simple. But it also has a back with um, not as much text as the Liverpool map. Uh, but it does have on the left side here identical language to Liverpool, which confirms that the circulation of drink maps was an organized strategy. So let's compare Liverpool and Sheffield. Um, the yellow is exact, exact language. I mean, some of it couldn't be exact because it's made by different publishers and um, different places, but clearly they were communicating about this. So this points to the United Kingdom Alliance having a strategy about how to use them and influence magistrates who were making decisions about granting licenses and renewing liquor license. Um, so on to what I think is the one of the prettier maps uh, I'll share with you. It's one of the most colorful. And this is the uh, map of license houses in Birmingham, not called a drink map. However, there I did find evidence that there was a colorful drink map of Birmingham in 1877. I haven't been able to see if it exists anymore. If anyone finds a drink map, by the way, um, I'm sure they're out there. I'm hoping this is just going to be scratching the surface and people will find more. I, I've already talked to three people that found more. I mean, I went to a pub and met a stranger and found one. So I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll be able to find some. Okay. So let's check out the railway area on this map. Very common, although it's kind of strange because railways were outside of the licensing scheme and often not included on the maps. Most of the maps got their places marked from police records because the police kept the records about the licenses and they had to go around and make sure that the objections were served or that people um, knew they were about to be discussed. So I'm gonna zoom in a little more closely. And this is what I just love about this map. The color just is um, different colors for different types of licenses. So let's talk about beer for a moment. Now I'm showing you a painting by a Frenchman, Edward Manet. Um, his last major work in 1887. I'm showing this to you, to you so you can see the reach of English beer, in particular, Bass. So this red triangle was the first trademark in the UK. And Bass also got the second trademark, same line that the clerk stood in overnight. Uh, and that's the brown diamond for the stout, not quite as famous. Um, but it, it, but it was their second trademark. So back to maps. Charles Booth was perhaps the most famous social reformer of his time, and he's remembered mostly for his poverty maps that used color to reveal the poorest parts of London, and it ended up being far more than anyone had expected. But Booth also made drink map of sorts. This is Tom Harper, by the way, at the British Library. 
He made a drink map of sorts in the back pocket of the last volume of his 17 volume treatise called Life and Labor in London of 1899. Booth enclosed a map showing three important institutions of life, the church, the school, and the pub. It's very curious that it's not necessarily like other drink maps where he's trying to shock people by how many places there are to get alcohol because it is the churches that are in red. And when you look at this map, you think, oh my gosh, are there a lot of churches in London? Because the red really pops. And then he used blue for schools and drink the places to get alcohol were in black at the same color as the streets. And they really kind of, they don't exactly pop off the page, let's say. Even more famous in their lifetimes was Lady Somerset. She, uh, as a social reformer, very similar background. They both came from sort of privileged background. Uh, Booth came from a family of ship owners, at, um, and they were very disappointed that he decided to be a social reformer. Lady Somerset came from a significant social family. Um, Alfred Lord, Lord Tennyson sent her bridal bouquet, and uh, royalty attended her wedding. But she was married for four years when um, she caught her husband in bed with a young man. And instead, at the time, she, they had a son who was four. And at the time, custody was presumed with the father. And the only way for her to get custody was to do something that recognized in the law that she should have custody, including um, that he had violated what was called at the time the laws of buggery. And she did. She was she won custody, but she was socially ostracized, and her um, husband, who they did not divorce because she didn't believe on the, in that and religious grounds, fled to Florence um, and is known to have been in a group of men, including Oscar Wilde. And people disagree about the inspiration for the star of the picture of Dorian Gray. However, um, his name was Lord Henry. And Lord Henry is the character in Dorian Gray who prefers young men. So whatever whatever you think. Uh, but she rose to become the president of the British Women's Temperance Association. And then she went to the United States. She met the American president. She spoke to over 2,000 people in Boston, her first port of call, and eventually rose to be um, the president of the World uh, Women's Christian Temperance Association. She was pretty controversial because she supported birth control, women's suffrage, and something I found kind of curious, licensing prostitutes in India for the benefit of British soldiers' health. She was pushed down for this, but actually her idea was we can protect them. We just have to test the prostitutes so they can be licensed and that will protect our soldiers. And people said, no, nobody's, nobody's consorting with prostitutes over there. So she did not win. Uh, how, and But anyway, I'm just going to show you her maps um, to compare because um, the one thing she was really known for is she launched a live-in care home for women where alcohol use was treated instead of punished, which was still a new concept at the time. It was very highly regarded, and she was invited to testify to the Royal Commission on Licensing Laws. She presented seven maps to support her testimony. I will show you the first two. Two more are in the book side by side to compare, which is how she presented them in her testimony. This is map number one of the Soho district stating there is one public house to every 17 inhabited homes. Second map is a mile of Whitechapel Road showing 45 public houses on one mile. So did drink maps work? Well, remember the 1878 drink map of Norwich, that city had three updated maps over 25 years. So let's look at the second one. This is 1892. It's very similar to 1878. Let's compare the numbers. So 1878 to 1892, there are only 24 fewer places. And on close inspection, I looked at these side by side and counted all the little places. Um, there's act, there actually, there are fewer but they're more concentrated. There are more, if they had done a yardage circle, you would be able to count more in the center of town than you would have been able to before. And the one that was published in 1903, the last one of Norwich, again, barely any decline in the number of boozers. So overall, I would say that drink maps did not work, but perhaps influenced the decline of, in drinking at the end of the century. There were more places to congregate, 
better water, bicycles, hobbies. I mean, people just were happier and healthier. So it, it made sense that drinking would decline, which it did, not just in the UK, but all, all over the world, at least as a sort of general trend. And now you know uh, a little bit of the drink map story. And in conclusion, heading into the early 1900s, Britain being reasonable and notoriously taking the steady hat path, prohibition was never a realistic threat. But in the US, um, the extremists won and prohibition became the nation's law in 1920. One major exception was medicinal. Alcohol could be prescribed by a doctor. And in 1931, prohibition was still the law when Winston Churchill was in New York giving a lecture. He was trying to cross the street and forgot to look to the left and set it to the right, which by the way, I've been here almost a week now and I, I've come near many fatal, almost fatal instances. So I understand where he was coming from. Oncoming cars are forming, coming from the opposite direction over there. And he was hit by a car going 35 miles an hour and he hit his head. He was instantly whisked to a hospital where um, his physician, Otto Pickert, not only performed surgery, he gave him something quite valuable in 1932 prohibition, a prescription for alcohol. So I am gonna read this only because I just wanna make sure everyone, it's um, amazing actually. This is to certify that the post-accident convalescence of the Honorable Winston S. Churchill necessitates the use of alcoholic spirits, especially at mealtimes. The quantity is naturally indefinite, but the, the minimum requirement would be 250 cubic centimeters. Does anyone know how much that is? It's a half a pint, a half a pint of spirits at the minimum for a day. That's that's a, a lot. Uh, so anyway, I, I also noticed that um, the correspondence between Churchill and his physician relating to this incident, incident recently sold at Christie's for $11,000, which was about 8,800 pounds. So going back to US prohibition, my grandfather graduated from pharmacy school in 1921. It was at the start of prohibition. His first job was in hotel pharmacy. Why would we have hotel pharmacies? Well, it's something that sprang up to quickly serve travelers who had liquor prescriptions. And oddly, no one in my family asked him before uh, he died, uh, you know, what was he doing at this age? But I think by looking at the next image, we know exactly what granddad was dispensing. So uh, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for your attention.